Well, there we are, Professor. Thank you once again for joining me on True 30. You are my first repeat guest. <laughs> so thanks for your really? time twice. Yes, sir. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> That's an <laughs> and, honor, man. <laughs> well, last time we talked about philosophy based on your background as a professor um, of philosophy, and it was a really cool conversation that ferreted a lot of really neat debates online. Uh -huh. And this one is specific to your new book, which is the Everyday Patriot oh, yeah. for those on YouTube. And it's how to be a great American now. And so as I talked about in my introduction, um, which you haven't heard, but it's there, um, you've written over 30 books in your impressive tenure. What inspired you to write this one and why now? You know, some of the most interesting books for me to do have been books that I wasn't planning on doing. And this this was one of those. I mean, <laughs> I never sat around saying, I want to get into the whole social and political realm as a writer. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Because I get a lot of nice mail from that, you know, yes. <laughs> you know, my early, no career, strong opinions <laughs> in you know, politics right. anymore. In my yeah. early career, I was in really technical philosophy, writing articles that 47 people in the world could understand. Understand, you know, and all the professional journals and that sort of thing. And then to all of us, to, to suddenly write a book called True Success, A New Philosophy of Excellence, that didn't cohere with anything I'd been doing earlier. But, but a guy asked me a question. He said, hey, do the great philosophers have anything to say about success? I said, I have no idea. You want me to look into it? And so, <laughs> so many of the books I've done, it's like a guy one day said to me, um, hey, Steve Jobs, reading this new Isaacson bi biography of Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was the biggest jerk in the history of the world, but he built the world's most valuable company. How does this, how is this possible? He said, could you give my board and my, my senior management team a talk on Steve Jobs? And rather than say, well, I know nothing about Steve Jobs <laughs> whatsoever, other than what anybody on the street would know. I said, okay. So I started looking into it, digging into it, talking to people Steve knew, talking to his direct reports, talking to the first guy he sold a computer to. I discovered all the stuff that wasn't in Isaacson. And I discovered all this philosophy. So I ended up doing a book called Socrates in Silicon Valley, yeah. comparing Steve Jobs with Socrates. And it was a fun project that I had no idea I would ever do. Well, same thing with the Everyday Patriot. So I was just sitting here at this desk one day and the phone rings. And it's Norman Lear, the famous TV producer, you know, all in the family, Sanford and Sons, all that. He said, hey, Tom, I, I'm calling you because I just bought a copy of the Declaration of Independence. I paid eight eight million dollars for it. I said, Norman, you <laughs> way overpaid, buddy. I got mine for four ninety five at Barnes and Noble. <laughs> he said, no, no, no. And he, he told me a story that I tell in the book. A guy buys a painting at a yard sale in Philadelphia just for the frame. He doesn't like the painting. He needs a frame for something he's got at home. So he takes it home, starts taking it apart. And as he's taking it apart, something's folded up in the back. And so he says, "What's this?" And he takes it out, unfolds it. It's one of the original uh, Dunlop broadsides. Uh, uh, printed uh, uh, July 4th, 1776, late at night in Philadelphia, one of 200 to be taken throughout the colonies, read aloud in public places so people would know what was going on. And Lear says to me, I didn't buy this, you know, just to put on the wall of my house or anything. It was, uh, they were only known to exist like 22 or 23 of these. And this was the new discovery. And he said, I want to send it around the country so everybody gets a chance to see the nation's birth certificate. Whether they live anywhere near a big city like New York or Washington, never get a chance to go to a museum or not, I want them to have a chance to see the Declaration of Independence. So do you want to do you want to travel with the Declaration? I said, what? He said, uh, how about going along with it and giving a speech at every whistle stop, every little town we stop in, you can give a talk about the Declaration of Independence. I said, I, wow. I said, you know, I've got a busy <laughs> speaking schedule, but this sounds interesting. And so I said, let me look into it. Let me reread the Declaration and let me think about it as a philosopher, what I would say to people anywhere in America about the founding ideals of our nation. And so I get to busy on this and I start writing up my results. Two weeks pass and Norman calls again. He said, hey, I got some bad news. I said, what? He said, I had to turn the decoration project over to a team of people. I got busy with other things in television. And he said, word leaked out in Hollywood like it always does. And now all the Oscar winners and all the award winners want to travel with the decoration. So my team leader comes to me and says, Norman, who's going to draw the big crowd, Denzel or your philosophy friend, Tom Morris? <laughs> so, Norman says, I think you're going to be able to stay home after all. And I said, all right, well, listen, I've written up these notes. 
you want to do a little book? Uh, I'll call it the Everyday Patriot. He said, yeah, you know, we'll sell it in connection with the decoration. So, so I didn't want to be in the book publishing business. I didn't want to be in the business of writing about American history. Um, so we just, we just did a, a little printing, thousands of copies, but a one-time printing of this little thing to travel along with. The, it was a small size book, smaller size than the one you just showed. And it looked different, it had an American flag on the front. And but people really bought it. I mean, one school superintendent read it and bought 3,000 copies for all his teachers. I mean, that's the response to it. This was 2001, 2002. And then I just kind of forgot about it. Hmm. So it turns out that about a year and a half ago, a guy calls me up and says, hey, you know, you did this little book years ago called The Everyday Patriot. I said, yeah. He said, I'm the guy who bought 3,000 copies of it. Oh, I said, oh, it's good to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> he, he said, um, can we have to talk together? I said, sure. I figure he's going to pay. You know, guy can buy 3,000 copies of my book. So I go out to coffee with this guy. And he said, you know, a lot has passed since you wrote your book in 2001, 2002. The biggest threats America faced then were foreign terrorism. The threats we, we face now have changed dramatically. Would you consider rewriting your little book for our time now? Hmm. And I said, oh, geez, I hadn't even crossed my mind. Let me go back and reread the little, the little book and see if I've got something new to say in light of what's going on in America now and around the world and other places, too, because I wanted to speak hmm. to patriotism, not just for Americans, but Anybody, like one of the, the new book, uh, one of my favorite pieces of fan mail was from a 19-year-old guy in Romania, uh, Bucharest, who wrote me and said, your book wants, makes me want to be a better Romanian, he said. Right. I said, all right, that's what I want to see happen, right? Um, so I, I came back home, I reread the little book, and all of a sudden I said, I got all these new ideas. And so I started writing, and within four months of all day, every day, I had the new version of The Everyday Patriot. And that's why this book exists, Joey. It wasn't me saying, oh, you know, as a philosopher, I think I've got something to speak into the culture at this, at this moment. I was busy working on other things. Um, but you listen and you respond to smart people. And of course, this is your whole life, right? You listen and respond to smart people. You come up with new perspectives and new ideas you never would have generated on your own. So this is why you do what you do. Right. Bringing people in to have conversations with. That's why I went and met this guy for coffee. Um, and so now this new version of the everyday patriot is just spreading everywhere. And I'm getting more mail, more emails, more podcasts, more interviews and from people on opposite sides of the political spectrum, which my wife said, you'll never please everybody. And I said, yeah, I know that I can't please everybody, but I might at least try to appeal to a broad spectrum of people, right? Left and right. And so a guy asked me to write us an op-ed for his newspaper that goes to politicians. And I told a friend, I didn't know who this guy was. He said, I love your book, The Everyday Patriot. You got to write an op-ed for my Okay, you know, so I wrote an op-ed with some of the main ideas. And I told a friend who happened to know him well, he said, oh my God, he's as different from you politically as a person could possibly be. And he loves your book. I said, wow. I guess I did something right. Well, you did, sir. I'll say this. It is very nonpartisan. There's yeah. not, there's no leaning whatsoever. And I can tell you as someone who reads politics every day, <laughs> I know within the first sentence where someone leans. So <laughs> that's, you did a, that's probably right. You did a great job on that. And, you know, I think in part, in, you know, I, we've known each other for years. I actually don't even know where you sit politically. <laughs> I mean, I just don't, because we've never talked about it specifically. I think we're probably, we are probably aligned on a lot of things. But I think what fascinates me specifically about you and your tenure and this book, George Washington famously warned about the two-party system, famously warned about tribalism. What do you think? Well, actually, no, let's, let's specialize this. You, you've often talked about uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey, specific yeah. to, yeah. and you've taught me, I actually didn't read that until you, so wow. thank you again for that. Awesome. But it was the stories themselves are wonderful, specific to tribalism. You want to tell our listeners a little bit about yeah. those tales and how they apply today, that what's going on? 
you know, the, I mean, here I've got on my desk, Emily Wilson's new brand there new translation of the <laughs> Iliad. Look at this thing. This is a, you know, Goliath of a book, almost as about the size of the Elon Musk biography. Right? <laughs> a little but more I, dense, I can tell you. It's a little <laughs> more dense. But a you know, more it's, dense. It's, it's funny because, you know, like a lot of people, I had to read the Iliad and the Odyssey at some point in school, right? And you kind of grit your teeth and you bear it and you get through it. And you kind of take away nothing. Bunch of Greeks, you know, a lot of wars, a lot of crazy things. But then several years ago, I decided the Odyssey. My father's best advice to me ever, my father was a very philosophical soul. He said, life is supposed to be a series of adventures. The one you're on now is preparing you for the next one. And often in ways you can't even imagine. And something haunted me about the Odyssey. It was, a, it was a, an adventure story, a story of a guy trying to get home and he's going through all these adventures with all these unimaginable obstacles. Um, I, I mean, as an adult, maybe I should reread the Odyssey. And I loved it so much. Then I read it a second time, and then I read it a third time, and then I read it a fourth time. In a year, I read it four times through. I don't think I've ever done that with any book. And then I said, well, wait a minute. This is a, you know, like a sequel to the, uh, to the Iliad, or that's a prequel to this. I love the whole idea of prequels <laughs> and sequels. You know? right. It's like uh, I heard a guy one time talking about prequels to famous movies. And he said, like, here would be a prequel. There goes Private Ryan. Hope you'll be okay. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> or another prequel, uh, we're running out of Mohicans. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, the Odyssey is a, pre is a prequel, or the, I mean, the, the Iliad's a prequel to the Odyssey. The Odyssey's a sequel to that. So I reread I re that for the first time as an adult. And then I started again on it. I read it a second time. I didn't read it a third or fourth. Now, this will be my third time with Emily uh, Wilson in my adult years. But all of a sudden, it occurred to me, and I'm going to tell you this before I get into the specific illustration I know you're kind of fishing for here because it's a great one. But all of a sudden it occurred to me the first time what the Odyssey is about. The Odyssey is about the power of purpose. Because here's this guy's trying to get home. He's got this really strong purpose to see his wife and his son. He's been away for you know 10 years and then 11 years and 12 years and 13 years. And it goes on 10, 10 more years. But the power of purpose is so strong, he confronts unimaginable stuff and still manages to get home. All right, so what's, what's the Iliad about? It's about the power of partnership. Because a whole book starts in the ninth year of the, the Trojan War. We don't even know what happened in the first eight years. It opens up the leader of the Greeks, Agamemnon, and their chief warrior, Achilles, are really mad at each other. Each of them thinks the other is getting more loot, more stuff. Agamemnon kind of starts the fight. And he says, I haven't got enough stuff. Uh, you know, uh, Achilles, you've got this great uh, slave woman. Give her to me. You know, and he goes, what are you talking about? It's complete insult. And, and there's rage between the two leaders that are supposed to be in partnership with each other against the Trojans. But they start fighting each other. And so the story spills out from there, all the carnage, all the damage, all the terror, all the heartbreak that comes from two guys who should be partners fighting each other instead. Well, that sets up the story I know you have in mind, which is on the plane outside Troy, where two guys who are supposed to be fighting each other, unlike Agamemnon and Achilles, they approach each other on playing Diomedes and Glaucus. And they're both great warriors. And they're described as approaching each other, most translators say, eager to fight. Uh, Emily Wilson, I looked at, I glanced at it already in her translation, keen to fight. So these aren't the guys who are the conscripts. These aren't the guys who were just forced to be there. I don't want to be, why do I have to fight? No, these are the guys keen to fight each other. And they approach each other on the battlefield. And Diomedes, who is known for his war cries, rather than screaming out and charging the guy with his spear, he says, before we do this, I got to know who you are. And Glaucus said, what are you talking about? And Diomedes says, I've been watching you. I've never seen you out here before, but all of a sudden here you are, you, you get the best of everybody. You're on top of every fight. 
You're the most courageous guy. You're the most skilled guy I think I've ever seen out of here. Who are you? I've got to know before we fight each other. And the guy says, well, you know, basically, he's like, I'm the guy who's getting ready to kill you is who I am. Well, no, no, no. More detail. Yeah. And Glaucus says something interesting. He says, okay. And then he says the word that's crucial. Listen. And he starts telling his story. I'm from so-and-so. My father's name was such and such. Um, his father's name was so-and-so who lived in this particular way. And it's like, whoa, 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 slow down here. Your grandfather was who? My grandfather was this person. And he did this. And he did this. And, and, and the other day, whoa, whoa, whoa. My grandfather and your grandfather were best friends. My grandfather stayed in your grandfather's house as a beloved guest. We cannot fight each other today. And the other guy, who's as bloodthirsty as they come, says, you're absolutely right. Let's change armor. Let's trade armor so our friends know to leave the other alone. We, we need to not fight each other. We need to protect each other today. Okay, let's do that. And so they take off this heavy armor in the middle of a field of when everybody is around them is killing each other, right? And they decide to be at peace because they found something they had in common. Because they found common values. They found something that brought them together. See, Achilles and Agamemnon, this whole thing started because they couldn't find anything to bring them together. They're just pulling apart, right? And, and you hear these guys on the battlefield, they find what they have. If anybody ever approached anybody else with the category of enemy, at top of mind, it was these two guys keen to fight. But they find something that peels off that label of enemy and sticks on a label of friend because of what they have in common. And man, Joey, as soon as I read that story for the first time, paying attention to it as an adult, I said, that's a problem in our culture right now. That's a problem in our nation right now. That's a problem in our world right now. We have too many people bringing the category of enemy to people they don't even know. Mm -hmm. They need to find what they have in common. And then they can be like Diomedes and Glaucus who gave us this amazing example of how shared history, shared values can bring people together. Now, it's, and that's actually the story you shared with me years ago that spurred me to read the Iliad and the Odyssey. It took me longer than it took you most likely, but it, <laughs> it, the idea there is, you know, we like to talk about at True 30, our origin was to create understanding without agreement. Oh, uh -huh. right. That was the idea behind yeah. the platform originally. And, and that's, I think, germane to investigative journalism in general is that you're not actually trying to craft a story. You're trying to get to the real facts of the story through evidence. And that's what the investigation allows yeah. as opposed to, you know, they, they say there's such things as, as uh, biased journalism and biased academics. So if you have an academic who is biased, then they're not really not an academic. And if you have a journalist that's a bias, they're really not a journalist. That's right. And I that's think right. the same they're thing. Propagandists, is, you know, they're propagandists. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hurtful to the cause. And I think yeah. that understanding is a really big piece of that narrative in a Greek tale. And then, you know, to move from the abstract to the proximate, it, you also talked about a, a guy who was pretty, I've read about numerous times now. Um, and he's someone that I thought was really applicable to your story as well. And that's Daryl Davis. Yeah. Because he's, it, he's amazing. And he did very similar stuff, you know, yeah obviously not at the same level and not with the pros of Homer, but why don't you tell us a little about Daryl Davis and why you decided to put him in your book? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because um, in the new edition of this book, I had just been talking to my old um, uh, speaking agent at the at uh, a major Washington Speakers Bureau. And uh, I think he's represented Daryl for some, from some talks. And he was telling me all about Daryl. You got, I got to get you guys together. I said, tell me his whole story. And so my friend, Tony, he starts telling me all, all these details. It was like, Daryl's in this bar and he was playing piano and he's an amazing uh, musician. And some, some white guy comes up to him, an African-American himself. Some white guy comes up to him and says, hey, man, you play the, why do you play the piano? How do you play the piano? Just like Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, you play just like Jerry Lee. I've never heard somebody, but, and he said, well, we learned from the same old black man man how to play piano. And the man said, Jerry Lee Lewis did not learn from some old black man how to play piano. He said, there was a, <laughs> yes, yes, he did. did. Jerry Lee and I are good friends and we learned from the same guy. And he said, how is this even possible? And so they get to talking. And so Daryl finds out this guy's in the Klan. And 
so he Ku Klux Klan, to be clear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. not some Scottish Klan, right? <laughs> <laughs> but he, uh, you know, they're not decked out with plaid, plaid shorts or anything, right? They're, right. It's the serious. Well, so it launches, make a long story short, it launches in Daryl's life a quest to understand why people could hate him who don't even know him. Like Diomedes and Glaucus gonna going to kill each other. They don't know each other. How can people hate me? without even knowing me. So he launches into a series of conversations with people in the Ku Klux Klan and other uh, white supremacy organizations. But he does that important thing of listening. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't approach everybody to convince them that they're wrong. He approaches them to understand what they believe and why they believe it. And, and, They've never been listened to by somebody on the, obviously on the other side. Scott's the wrong color from me and he's listening to me. Um, and so pretty soon they get curious about who he must be to be so interested in them. So they start asking him. And because he says such a great example, listening to them, they listen to what he has to say. And long story short, I think it's over 200 uh, former Ku Klux Klansmen who have given up their robes, who have left the Klan, other white supremacist or organizations, they've often given Daryl their robe. One guy, one of the original conversation partners. So Daryl invited him and his girlfriend to come to, to a museum in D.C. and to learn something about African-American history. And the guy did with his girlfriend. Eventually, they decided to get married. And her father can't walk her down the aisle. He's paralyzed. And so the former Klansman asked Daryl Davis to walk his bride down the aisle. Now, you talk about somebody changing. You talk about transformation through listening, through empathy, through compassion that sees a person as a person, not as a label, not as the adversary, not as an enemy, not as a Klansman. But human to human, they find things in common. And just like on that plane outside Troy, transformation happens, peace happens, and friendships open up. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing story. So I wanted to tell Daryl's story as well as the Iliad. So the people say, well, that's just Homer made that up. Or No, no, it happens in our day. It does. And I think that's really the allegory to much of your book is that understanding is really important, specifically today in a very tribalized culture. I, you know, there's a lot of historians that talk about, I think specifically historians, when they're asked, is this the most divisive time? And they're like, no, <laughs> it's not, <laughs> sadly. And I think that's a big problem with our culture in general is that we've yet to zoom out as a group, yeah. right? We don't have a lot of knowledge of history. I had yet to re I hadn't read the Declaration of Independence since college yeah. before your book, and I was probably hung over. So I probably didn't remember <laughs> much of it. But, you know, it it is one of those things about civic duty and and things around that nature that I think are really important with your book. And I like that you started off the book by talking about your own, I don't want to say apathy, but you actually have a chapter yeah. called Hitting Bottom, Yeah. right? And in the first sentence, it says, my patriotism, my patriotism bottomed out. Yeah. You want to tell us a little bit about that, where you were in that yeah. time? I mean, when I was a kid, I felt myself to be a proud American, right? I felt affiliation with my town, with my state, with my nation. I, I, I just grew up feeling like I was as much an American as I was a, a kid in my neighborhood. America meant something to me. I would sit on the floor at night and draw cartoons for the Kennedy kids in the White House, John, John, and Caroline. And my parents, I would say to my parents, would you send these to the White House? And my parents would say, sure. No, not like, what are you talking about? That's crazy. Sure. And so they put my cart my little cartoons in them and then sent in a packet and send them off to the White House. And then like a week later, I got this beautiful letter from the White House. It said the White House in this blueprint on this beautiful white envelope. And it was it was Mrs. Kennedy's social secretary, Letitia Baldridge, who became very famous, you know, etiquette expert in her own right, telling me about how much Mrs. Kennedy loved the drawings and how much the kids loved the drawings and how Mrs. Kennedy wanted her to write me and to tell me thank you. And it was like, OK, that's what America is. Any kid, I must have been in second grade, you know, or third grade at most. Any kid can write to the president and look what's going to happen. He's going to get a letter back from the White House. 
So I campaigned as an early adult, a young adult. I campaigned for a presidential candidate when I was in graduate school at Yale. I campaigned through Connecticut for a guy who was not popular in Connecticut. So I had really interesting uh, conversations door to door with people. I even wrote this guy a country music campaign song that I would sing for people and they would think I was utterly out of my mind. That's how into politics I was at a certain <laughs> point in my, of my life. And then all of a sudden you get married, you, you have children, you have a career, years pass. You barely make time for your friends. You're so busy and you forget to vote. Oh, was that was today election mm -hmm. day? And so, well, I didn't know really the issues. I didn't really, I hadn't really followed. I was too busy, you know, you know, too busy. Yeah, it was a busy day anyway. I, I couldn't have had time to go. Vote. Really? Really? That's the kind of excuses we make for ourselves. So I try to be real in this book and I don't spend a lot of time on it. But like you say, there's a short description of how I bottomed out. As an American, I was just on for, along for the ride. I wasn't trying to make a difference uh, politically in the world. And all of a sudden, it came back to haunt me how far I had fallen from my childhood sense of belonging and contribution. I was trying to contribute to the family life in the White House as a kid, sending cartoons to John, John, and Caroline. And here as the adult, I couldn't even go down the street and, and mark a little circle. I mean, what happened? So I try to give a quick diagnosis of why people say, yes, eh, uh, my vote doesn't matter. You know, I don't, it's not worth the trouble. I, I give all the rebuttals that you can possibly give to all these excuses we make for not being involved politically. And it's a funny thing because these days, a lot of people think of politics as a form of entertainment. Mm -hmm. So... You're involved just by tuning in and cheering your team on, you know. I mean, speaking of teams, it's entertainment, it's sport, mm -hmm. it's a game. And for some people, it's a form of war. So yeah. they're involved by shouting at the other side. They're involved by nasty tweets or X's or whatever they're called these days. They're, <laughs> they're, they, try to be, they try to be as competitive or as militant as they can be because they've got the wrong metaphor in mind for what politics is. So I tell in the book a story of I was sitting, I was giving a talk for, um, I think it was Hewlett Packard's Board of uh, Advisors for the Americas, North America, Central and South America. It was all the chief technology officers, chief information officers from their biggest client companies. This was years ago. Um, so this is before things got really nasty in American politics, a couple of years before things got super nasty. And so we're sitting, I gave my talk the day before, we're having breakfast together in the Ritz-Carlton Battery Park in New York City in this room with floor-to-ceiling glass wall that looks over the Statue of Liberty. There it is, right outside the room, the Statue of Liberty. And so breakfast conversation naturally turns to politics. And at a certain point, I sort of say at this big table of chief technology officers, I say, we well, you know Aristotle's view and so everybody like, wait, what? <laughs> Aristotle's view was that politics is the noble endeavor of seeking to discover how best to live well together. And there was this huge laugh around the table, an explosive laugh. I thought people were going to shoot their scrambled eggs out their nose or something. I mean, there was this, this shocked laugh. And so then the the hubbub quieted down a little bit, and one guy from across the table just stared at me and said, how did we fall so far? So there's a sense in which, in that moment, my bottoming out in my political life kind of parallel a bottoming out in the political life of America in our time. It's not that we haven't had tough times before. It's not that we haven't had adversarial times before. Well, we've got this kind of perfect storm of terrible things involving social media that previous generations did not have to contend with. We've got a level of pressure and busyness and, and uh, people striving in their careers that was unknown to many generations of America. We've got a lot of pressures on us right now so that either politics just slips away and you don't know who is who. These two guys right against each other again? Who are, I don't even really know anything about it. And you've got the other, who are the guys who are the Monday morning quarterbacks. They think of it as a sport. They got to help their team win or it's a battle. They got to help their army win. And in either case, things go really, 
badly wrong. So at that table, breakfast table in New York City, we ended up having an amazing conversation. People said, well, Aristotle talked about stuff like this. I said, yeah, he did a book called The Politics that nobody reads. And it's not easy to read, but he has so many good ideas in this book. Like what? Somebody said, okay. He believes the greatest formula for human accomplishment is really simple and really powerful. People in partnership for a shared purpose. People, plural, in partnership, a certain kind of relationship for a shared purpose. Remember, we just talked about Odysseus and the power of purpose. You got to have purpose, a shared purpose. We, 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 we talk about people, Agamemnon and Achilles, Diomedes and Glaucus, they can fight each other, or they can be in a more positive relationship. Well, the most positive of all is that of partnership. People in partnership for shared purpose. You read the new biography, just held it up of Elon Musk. Elon Musk, yeah, he did Tesla, he did SpaceX, he did this, he did that. It's never just Elon Musk, this whole team of people in partnership. Mm-hmm. Steve Jobs, whole team of people in partnership. Uh, we've got this tendency to shoot a marquee name up and put it in lights, flashing lights, but there's usually a partnership, a whole team behind anything that ever happens of merit. Um, and so Aristotle talked about the city. He says, what is the city in his book? Well, it's not just a bunch of roads and buildings. Well, it's not just a bunch of people. I know what it is. It's a partnership for living well. It's like, oh, what? It's a partnership for living well. And insofar as any city or any polis, their word for a city, um, it applies to a family, a business, a neighborhood, a nation, any group of people who forgets to think of themselves as a partnership for living well, things are going to start going badly. Things are going to start going wrong. So he had this amazing idea, a partnership for living well, people in partnership for a shared purpose, politics, how best we live well together. We need, Guess who knew about all these ideas? The founders of our nation, the, the people who wrote and edited and approved the Declaration of Independence, the people who built the values of our country. They read Plato's Republic. They read uh, Aristotle's Politics. They read Mm -hmm. uh, John Stuart Mill. They read John Locke, uh, British philosophers, Scottish philosophers. They were very philosophical people who drew on the best values ever, the best ideas ever created and founded our country on those. And when we forget those ideas entirely and start draping ourselves in either red or blue, and screaming at the people on the other side of the field outside Troy, uh, things go wrong. Things go badly. They do, sir. And I think that what I really enjoyed about that, you captured a story about Susan Scott Kerr and her husband. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> tell us a little bit about that, because this is really, for me, and I, I much like you, in my 20s, I was pretty focused on my career. And, and I, yep. I don't, yep. I genuinely don't know if I ever voted for that whole decade. <laughs> Just don't know if I did. Right. So I know exactly. I, I, I was there with you. But why don't you, because this story really talked about the examples specific to a passionate voter that really understands how important it is. So, so this is just one little story. And, and often you make an abstract point best with a great story, right? right? I came across a story of this woman and her husband. And their jobs transferred them to another country. And it wasn't just another country. It's like the other side of the world, other country. And an election was coming up. And they tried their best to figure out how to vote by absentee ballot. And they couldn't get the ballot from the embassy or whatever. And they kept trying. And, you know, they just decided, well, we're going to have to fly home to vote. And so, so here they are flying around the globe. Here I was. I would go down the street. Right. Here they're right. <laughs> taking a day or two to fly around the world with all the joys of air travel, right? Yes. They're flying around the world to go vote in a precinct in a state that was already for their favorite candidate. So it was like, what? And they said, you can't depend on people, other people, to do your own responsibilities for you. It's my duty as an American to vote in every election, and I'm going to do whatever it takes. Well, boy, when you come up against that, it's kind of a slap into the face for us sluggards, for us kind of lazy boys, for us who kind of, yeah, I'm doing other things that day. <laughs> right. Uh, wake up and realize what's going to happen 
if too many people are doing other things that day. In fact, I think we've already seen that in recent elections. We did. Yeah. 2016. And, you know, I think the neat thing, too, one of my favorite statements that she said when asked about why she put in so much effort, she said, apathy doesn't work in a democracy. (laughs) And I love love that that. part. That was a powerful statement. And, you know, getting back to like the Declaration of Independence and why this is so important for us to understand it. um, You, after rereading it, said, you wrote this, you said the content of the second sentence grabbed me right away. And the, con- that sentence was, we hold these truths to be self-evident, mm. that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Which, yeah. even if you haven't read it, <laughs> you've heard that, right? Everyone, everyone knows that. It's one of our largest pieces. And then you wrote this paragraph, which is one of my favorites in the book, so I'm going to read it. We can appreciate the full meaning of the values and principles behind our nation only when we properly understand that the happiness the founders insisted upon we are free to pursue is not a fragile state of mind or an ephemeral elation of the emotions. It is not simply a feeling of pleasure, a giddy exuberance, or an ease of comfort in the moment. True happiness is much deeper and broader than that. The ancient philosophers who inspired our founders had discovered that real happiness is a fundamental state of being. It's the factual, objective reality of a deep, overall satisfaction with our life, arising from work that is right for us, supported by relationships that are healthy for us, and augmented by a capacity both to each moment for what it is and then to build something good from where we are at the time. Which I thought was awesome, by the way, Professor. (laughs) Not that, you know, your double PhD from Yale paid off. Let's just say that. (laughs) So I'm glad you read that, man. I'm sitting here saying, oh, that's good. You know, <laughs> and, yeah, and how, many people, how many people right now don't have work that that satisfies them, don't have relationships that are healthy for them and and don't are not experiencing what the founders had in mind and are just in these shouting matches instead where nobody's happy, where no good things uh, come uh, come about as a result. So, yeah. so yeah, let's go back to what the founders had in mind because you know what? They weren't just old guys who knew nothing long ago. They were some really astute thinkers who mapped out, not perfectly, but amazingly well, uh, the things we need to think about if we're to live well together. Well, and on a platform, I think that's why your book was so, I think, poignant for me is that as a philosopher, you kind of tied these things together. You tethered the Declaration of Independence to obviously this, the Magna Carta and all the things that, you know, predated. You want to talk about prequels, right? Those are the prequels of this. And and I think that that's what's really neat. And then this is kind of where I want to take a, not a divergent path, but I watched one of your interviews about your book. And I watched many, but one of them actually came out where there was a caller while you're on the show who was very proud of themselves for pointing out that you did not quote any black voices in your book, Mm. which was both inaccurate (laughs) because you did, (laughs) obviously Daryl Davis being one of them, um, and a sign of the times. And what I mean by that is there is a minoritarian base on both sides of our body politic Mm -hmm. that is very critical yeah of our united states of america today yeah a lot of which has to do with presentism which for those that don't know it's the interpretation that past events in terms of moderate values and concepts apply today and i think that the reason that 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 young person was so impressed with themselves about pointing out that you didn't use any black voices is that there are many problems with our our wonderful values articulated in the Declaration of Independence yeah, yeah. and our Bill of Rights and everything else that's been, you know, crafted by these, by these men, uh, men of letters and men of, you know, numerous and diverse knowledge. And I think that that gets lost too, you know, in the world history of things. America is no different than any other conquested nation, right? We yeah. killed many people to take right. over our country, much yeah. like every other mm-hmm. empire in the world. Empire means there was death. Re- revolution means there was yeah. death. There yeah. was inequities. There was terrible things and atrocities that took place. I now 
have many progressive friends, um, not just in California, New York, where I've lived, that will not celebrate the 4th of July. No. They are vocal about it online. And they talk about the fact that they can no longer celebrate an oppressive nation that is origins are based in white supremacy and that we are still living in Jim Crow today. And I mentioned this to you because this is a big problem. Yeah. Right. It's, it's not yeah. that. And the universities, by the way, and again, a minoritarian base, more, more so with the elite, because I've interviewed numerous kids, uh, I shouldn't call them kids, young men and women that believe this. And I've yeah. done this on numerous topics that we reported on, whether it's gender ideology, you know, abolish the police, defund the police. Sure. Whatever the, the subject is, this comes up constantly. And it's one of those things that genuinely scares me because it's, it's a problem. And, and you, I think, and this is a question for me, whether the reader even read the book. Right. right. <laughs> because right. here's what you put specific to that question. Did the founders of our nation actually hold the moral and political values indicated by their bold and exalted words? Mm -hmm. They certainly didn't work as a group to free the enslaved people around them. <laughs> Nor did they suddenly embrace men and women native to the land as equal partners in their new experiment of nation building on the foundations of these lofty principles. Women were not immediately recognized as social, legal, and political equals. And then you wrote at length, about this. And I thought, you know, throughout the book. So it wasn't like you wrote this and said, hey, everything's perfect about America. You actually right. were very specific yeah. in this. And, and the reason I mentioned this is that if you look at some statistics today, specific to our country, and these things scare me, is that presentism is not our friend. Our right. younger generation is not embracing what you and I as older folks are embracing specific to, I think, an allegiance and a true patriotism for where we live. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing it in true statistics today. So the all-volunteer military has reached a crisis level of low recruitment, while at the same time, the American public's perception of the armed forces is increasingly divided. A recent Gallup poll found confidence in the U.S. military at its lowest level in over two decades. Mm -hmm. Only 60% of people told Gallup they had confidence in the U.S. military. At the same time, military branches are failing, sh falling short of their yearly recruiting goals by the thousands. The army on its own has set to fall 15,000 recruits short this year. Mm. And so this is a combination, and I've read this, it's not just the lack of patriotism. It's also that we have a, a younger generation that is <laughs> sadly not in good enough shape to get yeah. through right. basic training. Yeah. Right. So there's, there's a, there's a, like anything, there's multivariate analysis to why this isn't working, but yeah. I broached this with you because I wanted to get your take on specifically as a former professor at Notre Dame is our un are our universities, specifically our elite universities, harming the cause of bringing in all the postmodernism that they talk about today the fact that we are a nation of white supremacy. I mean, you see it everywhere, right? I mean, I see it as someone who studies politics constantly is that there is more negative narrative about the United States of America than I've ever seen before. Yeah. yeah. And, it's, yeah. and it's not with you and me. It's not with us older folk. Right. You know, it's, it's for the, our younger generation. And that's a really scary thing, Professor. Yeah. I mean, yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, what, one thing is a lot of young people, when they go to, to college, especially, um, okay, who are all these college professors? Um, they're people who were trained in being critical. They were trained in reading classic texts or contemporary texts, and their job in graduate school uh, when they were themselves students, their job as undergraduates, then their job as graduate students increasingly was to find flaws in this argument, find flaws in this book, critique this line of thinking. They're not, we don't, we don't have thousands of professors in any given university who are all 
great idea creators on their own. They got to where they got to typically by being good critics of other people or maybe even severe critics of other people. So they come into the classroom as critics. So whenever topics come up relative to America, our culture, our way of life, the present day, they tend to be very critical because that's the skill they've developed over the years and it's gotten them tenure, you know, because they, they right. half the articles, right. half the articles that get people promoted in tenure are just criticisms of other people's work because very few people have new, amazing ideas themselves as young professors, untenured professors. And so they write articles criticizing other people. That's how they got into the classroom and got to stay in the classroom by being critical. So young people come in and they just hear all this criticism. And so they think that, well, I'm going to emulate these professors. I'm going to be very critical, too. So we're not encouraged to be constructive contributors to our place, our society, our way of life. We are conditioned to be critics. And that might be a good preliminary stage for any mindset because to make an improvement anywhere, you first got to understand what's wrong, mm -hmm. but it can't be where you stop. So I sometimes call my view articulated in the Everyday Patriot. And I draw on, a sto as you know, a Stoic philosopher that nobody's heard of in a day when Stoicism is everywhere. He's, he's named Heracles. And he's, he's, he's got this view uh, uh, that I develop in the book, and I name it contributory localism. Our job as patriotic Americans is to be contributive, to make positive contributions locally to where we live. First of all, I mean, Heracles, and you remember there's this idea of concentric circles, like an archery target. And and that a circle will map your life, a circle, a, a set of concentric circles will map my life, the innermost circle is my own heart and mind. Okay, job one, make my own heart and mind as good as they can be. Uh, become a good, positive, moral person, uh, a, a deep person, a mature person, um, a loving person, and then contribute that to your family. Uh, help your family and your household be as good as it can be, and then contribute your family and your household to their neighborhood to help that neighborhood be better than it would otherwise have been. Help the neighborhood then contributes to the city, which contributes to the state, which contributes to the nation, and finally the world, and you get Diogenes, I am a citizen of the world. So this whole idea of contributory localism is that work where you are to make things better with an idea on that expanding to the next circle and the next circle and the next circle, and then go hold those outer circles accountable for supporting their inner circles. So the state, the nation should not abandon certain parts of the country, should not abandon certain cities. The city shouldn't abandon certain neighborhoods in that city. All the enclosed circles should be supported so that they can make their best contributions to the larger whole. Students aren't being taught this image for their role in the world, and it's a tragedy. They're being taught to be critics. They're not taught to be contributors. And when I see that being reversed at various parts of our educational system today, like, for example, I'm really proud of the scholarship that sent me to UNC Chapel Hill, uh, the Moorhead Kane Scholarship, uh, because... They are all trained uh, and, and grounded and mentored, all the Moorhead Kane scholars, in how to contribute to their world wherever they are. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just in awe of these undergraduates. I went to give them a talk a few months ago in Chapel Hill about success and the kind of questions I got and the kind of people. One girl yesterday, young woman yesterday, she's going to graduate uh, this spring. She's a Maria Kane scholar, and she said, hey, I, I read what, something you wrote on happiness today on LinkedIn. Can we talk about it soon? Um, I'm backpacking across Europe right now, and I'm trying to get into a monastery right outside Kathmandu to interview some Buddhists about their views of happiness, but I want to talk to you first. And I'm thinking, what? You know, what? I, you know, I went down to the restaurant downtown and had a pitcher of beer when I was at her stage at, <laughs> in college. And, right. <laughs> and she is traveling the world, trying to figure out how to make her difference for good for other people. So it is being turned around. That's the cool thing about when things get really bad, uh, Joey. I've got this pendulum picture in mind. Uh, a pendulum swings only so far, it gets to its worst point and it starts to swing back. And I was in Russia right after the breakup of the Soviet Union, and I was 
in St. Petersburg. And I was one day in this neighborhood that was these beautiful houses. Well, it used to be beautiful, covered with graffiti, and there were weeds three feet high in the yard. And it was just awful. It was dirty. It was filthy. And I said, how do people live like this? I mean, now I didn't have to go to Russia to see this. There are neighborhoods in America just as bad, right? But it's kind of like death to the spirit. And then I thought to myself, you know what? It's interesting. Things get amazingly bad and nobody does anything about it. But when things get literally intolerable, it's a wake up, an imaginative wake up call to everybody. So I kind of think I see a pendulum swing coming back in a better direction because of the very things you've talked about just now. It's like, where are these things going to take us? Where are they leading? Where are they going? Are they taking us to a new golden promise land? Or are they going to take us to the edge of a cliff? Yeah. And I think people are saying, okay, we got to stop just criticizing everything and figure out what to do about it. And that's what I'm seeing in so many of the young people I talk to nowadays, early signals of that turnaround. I like to hear that because I just share the same thing. I was at an event recently at Stanford University, and I had a chance to talk to a group of young kids. And, and they were all very positive about, obviously these are kids at Stanford. So, you know, they have their whole life ahead of them and they do believe that they are yeah. geared for it. And what we talked about, cause we were talking about journalism, but the idea there was that they were impressed, you know, by what's going on. They were able to discern uh, the attacks from both parties, you know, on yeah. institutions today, on, on America itself as, as a Republic. And I think that the neat thing about Weir Book is that it it does get a little bit prescriptive, right? Yeah. In the sense mm -hmm. of, hey, it's it's not just, hey, you know, read the Declaration of Independence and try to, to absorb what that really means and understand the history of our founding fathers specific to their platform of knowledge, which was obviously part and parcel to the Greeks and the Stoics in general. So you're like, these, that's a pretty deep thing. And I wouldn't expect a lot of folks who are busy working 10, 12 hours a day to dive into that level. Um, but what I really appreciated, specifically the end of your book, you had some wonderful ways to be active in your community. So I want you to share some of those ideas. Specifically, you talked about voting every day, which was another chapter. Why don't you share a little bit about that? Because these are, these are very prescriptive, easy to do things that I think would be a, you know, in mass would be a wonderful uh, pivot, you know, yeah, in the right yeah. direction as far as what we can do as citizens. Well, yeah. And so, so I started off in the book just trying to urge people to vote in every election, right? And yeah. then I realized, wait a minute, whenever I'm talking about a new topic like voting, new, new for me to talk about, I always like to do a little word study. I like to do some etymology. So what's the history of the word vote? You know, what, what did it come from? What did it mean? I, I you know, did that for patriotism in the very beginning of the book. Why am I even using the word patriotism? It's such a hot button word these days. Um, and, and and so I, 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 I learned that the, the word vote, uh, it has a, a linguistic history meaning just to choose. Uh, what do you elect? What do you choose? What do you choose to pay attention to? What do you choose mm -hmm. to do? Uh, and I thought, whoa, wait a minute. I shouldn't just be encouraging people to vote in every election. I should be encouraging people to pay attention all the time, to choose all the time in favor of their neighborhood, city, town, state, nation. Uh, I should tell people they should vote every day with <laughs> their time, with their energy, with their attention. And what does that mean? What does that mean? It means when I go on my neighborhood walk once or twice a day, um, I'm not oblivious to that piece of trash. I'm not oblivious to that nail in the street that could take out somebody's tire. I reach down and pick it up. And if I've got some place I can put it fine, otherwise I'll put it in my pocket and bring it home, you know, um, and 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 deal with it appropriately. That's voting every day. That's paying a small attention, trying to make my neighborhood a better place. Same way I live a, a, mile, a mile from the beach. Same thing over at the beach. If I'm reaching over to pick up something a tourist has left in the sand. I sometimes wonder why I don't see 12 other people doing the same thing. Um, just trying to make my little spot of the world uh, a little better. There was a book I bought 30 years ago, I guess, called Perfecting a Piece of the World. And I, I remember a lot of detail about the book, but I, but I love the title, Perfecting a Piece of the World. We can't perfect the world. We can't perfect our nation. But maybe my little spot every day. And so then I try to broaden out from this. How about, you know, my wife did volunteer teaching in the public school system. Mm 
And kids who were disruptive would be taken out of class and given to my wife. And she found out why they were being disruptive. They were getting no positive attention in their personal lives at all. Mm -hmm. So she started lavishing them with positive attention and with praise, which they never heard any praise from from any caregivers at home. And all of a sudden, these kids started doing better in in the classrooms. She didn't have to go into the school. It was only a a block from our house or a block or two from our house at the time in in South Bend, Indiana. But, But she wanted to help perfect her little piece of the world, right? And it benefited our kids being in class with kids less disruptive because Mm -hmm. they were getting some of the attention they needed. And the teachers would come to my wife and say, thank you so much for what you're doing. I tell a story in the book about a retired CEO here who lives a block from me. He started um, a reinsurance company uh, headquartered in in, um, Bermuda. And um, he's retired twice uh, and they pulled him back. You know, it's like the Sopranos, they pull you up just when you think you're out. But his first retirement, he said, you know what? He had been on the boards of lots of Boys and Girls Club, you know, United Way, things like that. He says, why don't we do philanthropy in a different way? Why don't we get a bunch of people together and ask him for a small yearly contribution that, given the numbers in the group, will add up to a pretty big amount. And we'll go to an organization like the Boys and Girls Club and say, look, we're going to give you all at once $100,000 or maybe more. What if you can show us what you need that you haven't been able to do because of the way donations trickle in unpredictably? You never know what you commit to. What have you been wanting to do that if we give you a big amount of money all at once, you can finally do? And the people who were able to convince, uh, so we had these people and we would get together uh, three or four times a year to have a great dinner, to have a visiting speaker who would speak for free because this was, we were trying to give all, you know, all the money. We didn't want to pay speakers. We wanted to give our money right. to the uh, the worthy community causes. But we had amazing people who caught the spirit. You know, Jeff Foxworthy, the comedian, would, would come and entertain us with some of the best I'd never thought. You know, you know you're a redneck when right. this guy, yeah. he can talk to a group of philanthropists and get everybody just laughing so hard they're falling out of their chairs. Uh, Jeb Bush came and and gave an amazing uh, talk, and I sat across the table from him at dinner that night, and he was continually perplexed by the fact, well, he kept saying to me throughout the evening, Wait, let me get this right. You're a philosopher and you get paid for that? <laughs> he kept saying it over and over <laughs> But we would have all these amazing people. The guy who won the America's Yacht race, the skipper who won the race more than any other captain in, in history, would come and talk to this group. But it was just one guy started this group, let's make a difference in the community. And it started getting around what we were doing. And it didn't take anybody to give a lot of money, but it was just the cumulative, you know, a sum total of all of all the giving. And people can get involved. How did that happen, though? How did that happen, sir? I mean, what what did you just give us a little bit of an understanding how it started to grow? So this guy came okay. and talked to you and said, hey, yeah. Tom, he let's neighbor. get our he group said, together. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was my neighbor. And so he said, hey, let's go get coffee together. And so he told me his idea. And he had one or two other people in mind that he was going to tell early on. And he was kind of picking out friends of his that he thought might share this vision and also might know a lot of people in town. And so... And this is local, said, right? This, this is, is not... Totally local. Okay. This is not a, a you know, part of a national movement or organization. Right. Totally this guy's idea. And it was called, originally called One Wilmington. I live in Wilmington, North Carolina. And it was called One Wilmington initially because we want to bring together what was traditionally called Old Wilmington, the Old South part of Wilmington, and New Wilmington, which is people from New York and Paris and London and L.A. and all over the place okay. who moved here in the last 20 years. We want to bring the old people and new people together to get them to know each other. We, we want people to know to get to know each other, not just for the intrinsic value of having new friends, which is good too, but so maybe since they meet within the auspices of this organization trying to do good things in the community, they'll come up, they'll spark each other with new ideas about things to do in the community that nobody's thought of before. Mm -hmm. And so we started getting the word out. And I can't remember how many people, and so he he wrote me in to be in the first free speaker, you know, and and so (laughs) that's why he asked me basically to be a free speaker for his first meeting. And so um, I can't remember, we we may have had 50 to 100 people at that first meeting, you know. Wow. Yeah. It was like we laughed a lot. We talked about ideas. I think I talked about what the great philosophers said about success, because these are all really successful business people, typically, or doctors in town or whatever. And so then we got to work. 
And they started bringing in the people who were benefiting from these grants to give a talk. And they was like, people were like so moved by what they're their joint giving, because this was a new model of philanthropy. Usually you don't get a bunch of people together and say, let's just give a chunk of change all at once to a group to see what right. they can do with it. And um, it's been a success now. It's still going on. It's probably been 20 years that this has been going on, more than that, probably. And uh, it started from nothing, you know. Well, it started from people in partnership for a shared purpose, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're very good at this, Joe. <laughs> hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but that's it. You know, that's that's actually where I think the origin story, the way you crafted this narrative in 130 pages, which I know you did on purpose, because yeah. we have a short attention span theater out there specific to reading. <laughs> yeah, that, there you go. Yeah, you know, we held up the uh the yes. Odyssey, so no, yeah, but it is it's not the Iliad, <laughs> it's not the Odyssey, it's not Elon Musk's book. <laughs> it's easy to read, folks. So Again, sir, I always appreciate your time. You've been a mentor to me for years. I've always appreciated what you teach me, what you will continue to teach me. And I hope this book teaches our fellow Americans that it isn't overly difficult to vote, not only at the ballot, but voting on your decisions and what you choose to do on a daily basis. So thank you again, sir, for your time. I always appreciate it. Thank you, Joey. You, you know, you're a great person to talk to. I appreciate your investment in helping to make the world a better place. And, you know, if we talk about the right things and then do the right things on that basis, we're, we're going to make it happen. <laughs> we sure will. Thank you again, sir. Thanks.